Hello everyone, welcome back to World War II TV and we are about halfway through our week looking at the Hurgan Forest, the campaign or battle depending on your point of view. So we've covered very much the overview, the strategic purpose of it or the lack of strategic purpose. We've looked at some of the figures and Hodges and Cota things. Yesterday was much more personal. We talked about the Medal of Honor action, which was really a fantastic show with Frank Vazic. And today, similar to that show really, is we're following one person, but this time we're following someone who is making a book and a movie, a documentary about an individual. So Clement was back with us in May talking about Missing Highlander, his first film, which I had the privilege and honor of attending its premiere in Caen in June. That seems an eternity ago now, but it was only about six months. He's back now to talk about this new film featuring a member of the 4th Division who fought in the Hurton Forest. So I'm going to bring Clement back in now. So, And as always, folks, don't forget all the links you need are in the description below. The links to Clement's website, the prod, the book, the trailers, things like that. Everything you need will be there. If it's not there already, it will add more stuff after the show. But I'm going to bring Clement in now. Good evening, sir. How are you today? Hello, Paul. Thank you very much for having me back on the show. Well, it's great I'm to have you, and, and it, it was it was great to attend your your premiere. And you're doing as as we established there, and we established in the first show. You're bringing a, a multimedia approach to telling these stories. It's it's words, it's visuals, it's audio, and and that is the modern way. We like this aspect on of of the sharing of history. So. Tell us, I mean, obviously we know a little bit about what you talked about the last time, those who saw that, but just for a few seconds, introduce yourself, tell us what you do, what, how you come across these projects, and what, what's, it, what's it all about? Yeah, so um, I, I specialize in wartime correspondence. Um, I collect World War II letters of Allied soldiers, and uh, I'm French, uh, for those of you who wonder what my weird accent is. Um, and um, so, yeah, I wrote a few books, including Till Victory uh, there. Um, and now I'm working on a new book called Till the Job is Done about um, a fourth infantry division officer um, who served uh, from Normandy to uh, the Hürgen Forest. So that's the reason why I'm here tonight. Um, and it, it all started when I found his letters online, like huge box of letters uh about 250 of them uh and uh, most of the time when you buy big um uh, lots of letters like that they are not that interesting you know uh but this time i got very lucky because uh the letters are extremely interesting um he self-censored his own mail so and he wrote about everything like ongoing operations everything he wasn't supposed to talk about um and that was fascinating. And I thought that um, this man deserved his own book. Um, and this time I wanted to go even further because, uh, you know, I, I've read so much about uh, the Hurricane Forest and everything. And I wanted to see it for myself. And 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 I actually wanted to go on his footsteps because uh, when you, you write about a soldier like that, um, you uh, like for Chill Victory, there were more than 50 different soldiers in it. So it was kind of hard to do. But when you focus on one individual, um, I thought it was cool to just go exactly where it was. Um, I even found the HQ where he was, uh, where he actually wrote the, the buildings in, in, in which he actually wrote his letters. And I thought that it would be very, very interesting to um, go into his footsteps and record everything and, and make a full documentary about, uh, about it to go along with the, um, with the book. Um, so both the film and the book will be released together uh, next June. Um, and I think they... Um, uh, complete each other you know uh you you are reading all these letters uh in the book and and you see where it fought uh in the film and i interview uh witnesses veterans and you know experts um historians that was a fascinating experience to uh to do that and i finished the shooting in, in the hurricane forest uh last october uh i went there uh like you did um to uh to see the forest uh, with my uh, own two eyes, and that was quite an experience. I mean, it is it is a, an environment that I think you have to see it. I mean, I would say that about yeah. most battlefields, but some of them, like an urban combat, you can kind of imagine it. If you live in a city, you can imagine combat in another city. But the Hurricane, as we've established this week, because of the 
the the elevations and the hills and the damp and the narrowness of those gorges and trails it is an environment you you have to, have to go and see but short yeah. of being able to go and see it and there are people around the world watching a documentary film with modern you know high definition definition equipment can pretty much take the viewer there and that's we talked about that last time is the revolution of you I'm not gonna call, you're not quite a one man band because you have other people involved with you, but it is a very very small team that puts this together, and yet you can create something that is visually as striking as a multi million uh, mo uh, dollar movie. Um, should we start with a little one minute and twenty minutes long set trailer just to set the scene? Of course. Of course. Right so so folks, yeah. this is a, a preview. It's uh, all through Clemence, uh, honest. Uh, um, fact he's going to share it with us to, so it can't be exclusive for world war ii tv so we'll play that and then we'll then we'll talk about it afterwards so here we go quelque part en allemagne novembre 1944 ma chérie je crois que tu ne peux pas imaginer ce que je ressens depuis que j'ai reçu ta lettre dans laquelle tu m'annonçais que le médecin avait pronostiqué le grand événement pour ce début novembre je me demande toujours si le bébé est maintenant déjà arrivé et si c'est un garçon ou une fille. J'aimerais plus que tout au monde être avec toi en ce moment, chérie. Mais comme c'est impossible, je ne peux qu'espérer et prier. Souviens-toi que c'est ce que je fais constamment et que cela m'aide beaucoup. Les hommes et les officiers qui font partie de cette division depuis le jour J et qui ont combattu tout au long de la campagne de Normandie disent que c'est l'endroit le plus dangereux qu'ils aient jamais connu. J'ai moi-même échappé à la mort de peu à quelques reprises mais j'essaie de ne pas trop y penser. Ça nous rendrait fous si on s'en inquiétait. Nous devons faire notre boulot, même si nous avons peur. Mais permets-moi de t'assurer que tous les hommes et les officiers ici présents sont déterminés à poursuivre le combat jusqu'à la fin, quel que soit le temps qu'il faudra pour y parvenir. C'est ce que nous sommes venus faire ici, et aucun d'entre nous ne penserait à partir tant que le travail n'est pas accompli. So there we are. And uh, is it going to event? People will only ask, is it eventually going to have an English audio as well as a French audio? No, uh, for, for the missing Highlander, I, I did the movie in English with French subtitles. Um, and I got a lot of flack from my French friends. So <laughs> <laughs> this time I'm going to do it in, in, in French with English subtitles. Um, but, um, But yeah, um, it, it's going to be in French this time. But the book will be in both uh, yeah. versions. It's going to be a French version and an English version. Um, but uh, I mean, it, it's kind of a mix because there are interview, uh, you know, um, veterans uh, interviewed in it and everything. And, 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 I, and I, I've kept their uh, original uh, uh, speeches. Well, well brilliant i mean and people are already saying it, it looks incredible and it does look incredible i mean as you said the visuals you can recreate individually now it's 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 so so i'm not saying it's easy to do because it's lots and lots and lots of work but it is theoretically easy to achieve a very professional in, uh, uh, output providing you you put the work in so let's get back to the project and you know you teased about the fact that these letters had a lot in them beyond just the the hello, how are you, which I've read a lot of World War II veteran letters, and a lot of them are, yeah. as you say, they're just, you know, people keeping their family up to date with how they are. There's And yes, I got the jam you sent, and uh, did you get my last birthday card, that kind yeah. of thing. So when you first, how many letters had you read when you realized, wow, this is that there's something special here? Well, I, at first, I, I thought it, it would be a, uh, It could be in addition to a future project with multiple soldiers. But uh, as I went along and, and I thought like, okay, you know, I set all these interesting letters apart and I was like, okay, here's another one and another one and another one. He was talking about, you know, his men shooting prisoners and, you know, the destruction everywhere. It, uh, there was just too much uh and and you know he clearly deserved his own book uh and this is really really rare to find um such um 
an interesting uh, correspondence. Uh, he was writing to his wife, but he was uh, he was not worried about uh, worrying her. Actually, you know. Um, so yeah, I read them all. Uh, it took quite a bit of time, and I uh, transcribed them all and uh, and uh, translated them all in French. Uh, so that that was quite a lot of work. <laughs> But uh, it was worth it because it's uh, really a fantastic read, and I'm really looking forward to to sharing it. Um, yeah, I can I can read you a few uh, a few extracts if you want um, excerpts. I think you say. Yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm just for, before you read us a couple of extracts, then the, yeah. the route the fourth took is so fascinating because yeah. obviously everybody knows they were there on Utah Beach on June the sixth, yeah. and then they had those horrendous losses putting pushing up towards Cherbourg in a in a rather not forgotten battle, but overlooked, I would say. And then later on the Normandy campaign, they're kind of on the fringes of things. They're not they're, they're kind of part of Cobra, but they're not part of the exciting part of Cobra. And then they go across France in perhaps not the most the most um, prominent areas of France. So they were always there. And you can see by that map there, they were always there. And yet somehow after D-Day, they never quite got the attention of some of the other units. Um, so so our hero made that entire journey. Uh, not all the journey because uh, he arrived as a replacement uh, pretty late after D-Day. He arrived right. in in July, um, but he uh, stayed uh, for a few weeks in Saint Mary Eglise. Yeah, and he uh, because he spoke French, he was able to uh, talk with the civilians, uh, made friends, great friends with quite a lot of them, and and he wrote about it all in his letters. Uh, you know the way the French people used to live, um, all the uh, destruction, the um, the malnourishment. Uh, it, it's really a fantastic uh, uh, testimony of you know what was going on at the time for uh, the, the the French civilians uh, and he um, was um, assigned to the fourth division um, in the first days of August um, and and fought during the break the breakout of Normandy um, all the way to Hurtgen. so he was one of the first uh, in Paris uh, liberating Paris um, and uh, he actually was there when uh, the uh, um, you know von Schultz, uh, uh signed the, the surrender at the mm -hmm. Gare Montparnasse. Um, and yeah, it, it's he writes about it all. Um, and then he fought during the, the Siegfried Line battles and the Hürgen Forest, uh, where he was he was uh, wounded um, in early December. Uh, so I thought that you know after he was wounded that. You know the the interesting parts in the letters would end there, and that uh, uh, maybe I should stop here. But um, it got even more interesting uh, while he was in the hospital because he was reflecting about um, um, peace, the cost of war. Mm. Uh, he was telling about all the men that he lost during the battles. Uh, his um, you know, he wanted to get back to his unit as fast as possible, even try to uh, uh, run out of the hospital. Um, and um, yeah, and he learned about his brother being killed uh, in the Pacific as well. So a lot of stuff happening while he was in the hospital. And of course, the most important thing, and to me, that re resonates a lot. Uh, uh, you probably heard my baby uh, crying uh, in the background. Uh, it's uh, wh while I was writing uh, the book and reading his letters, uh, he was the same age as I was, 34. And he was expecting his first uh, son uh, while he was fighting in the Hurricane Forest. Um, so, you know, I always get, you know, it always... I always get personal, you know, with these soldiers. Uh, I, I um, there's this kind of emotional connection when you read um, very private letters like that. And but this time it was even stronger than uh, than usual because uh, we were going through the same thing. But I was just waiting for my kid to show up, uh, you know, in my in my cozy home, uh, you know, while he was in a foxhole in the Hürgen, uh being shot at. And he only learned about uh, his son being born uh, a month after uh, he was born uh, because uh, the male situation in the Hürgen forest was a nightmare. Um, 
and he was wounded three days later. So, uh, you know, it, ma it really makes you think, you know, uh, how lucky we are. Uh, yeah. What a terrible time he must have been through. I cannot imagine, you know, uh, not having any news from my wife uh, being at the hospital, uh, you know, wondering if my child was born or not. You know, it's it's really uh, he, he must have been through so much. So, and and if I'll let you read letters in a minute, but if he was thirty four, do you think that's why he was a little bit more reflective than some of the guys who are eighteen, nineteen, who perhaps are still. Uh, excited about everything they're perhaps not quite as aware of the of the, the the dangers and the horrors and the and and certainly don't kind of look backwards but if you're 34 especially you say you're expecting a child you're thinking about the future you're thinking about the yeah. past and maybe at an age where you can process some of this stuff and uh, and and think about it we also got a question as well about whether or not um because he's an officer that would have had his letters be censored a bit less because they were often censored by fellow friends and officers more than enlisted man is that why some of the information got through do you think yeah um the officers uh, used to censor their own mail uh you can you can see it you know if i take uh, any uh envelope there uh you can uh actually see um at the bottom here uh he wrote his own name that's, yeah. uh, you know, usually the officer would write his own, uh, his name there uh, to see, uh, to, to, to show who censored the letter. Um, and he wrote his own name. So he censored his own letters. Um, yet he was not supposed to to talk about ongoing operations and, and very sensible subjects like, obviously, uh, you know, uh, his men shooting German prisoners and stuff like that. But he, you know, he took the risk. Uh, I think he wanted to share uh, stuff that he couldn't share with. I, I don't know what his relationship was with the, uh, you know, with his men. Uh, he probably couldn't say uh, much about what he was feeling, um, you know, um, thinking because because of the, the rank, you know, uh, difference. So he told everything to his wife, uh, who was uh, his confidant. So, so mm -hmm. that's why it's so interesting to read these letters. Uh, and, and very few of them were censored by uh, another officer at the base, you know. Um, so, yeah, a lot, a lot of very interesting information went through. But, but it's not that unusual, you know, uh, even for uh, simple soldiers. The, the thing is that um you know the officer used to censor uh, the officers used to censor the mail after a long day of work uh you know uh and work being you know uh being uh, on the front line uh being shot at so uh, and they uh went back to their foxhole with a huge pile of letters of their men to to censor and you know sometimes they just did you know did it I mean, there, there's even until victory a soldier who wrote about uh, being friends with uh, his officer, and his officer used to uh, write his own uh, name, uh, his name on the the the, the cover uh, before he even uh, wrote the letters. Uh, so uh, you know, some of them just didn't care about that. The the, the only risk was that if they got captured, um, the mail uh, could give information to the enemy. Uh, but you know. Um, they wanted to share, you know, that that was their only link to home um, and their loved ones. And sometimes they just didn't want to alarm. They self-censored themselves, you know, like didn't want to alarm their families. But, uh, you know, when it was just too much, they, they had to tell uh, about their living conditions and what was actually happening. So, so before you read some letters, Jeff is asking if you can give a little bit of a. I mean, you don't want to give anything away. You don't want to give away. But when did he join the army? What was his background before the war? Tell us a little bit about the man. Then, then perhaps read a couple of letters. Yeah, his um, uh, career officer. Uh, he joined the. Uh, he was born in 1909, and he joined the National Guard uh, when he was uh, 17. Uh, like his younger brother Maurice, who would end up being killed in the Pacific. Um, but. Um, yeah, he, he uh, went through a lot of training courses and became an officer. Um, and he joined as a um, replacement. Um, he was already a captain. Um, 
uh, he, he, he worked uh, at the uh, regimental HQ uh, of the 8th Regiment uh, when he joined the 4th Division. And at some point during the Battle of Hurtgen, um, the losses were so heavy that he uh, was put in charge of E Company uh, for a short time before he was wounded um, in, in late, sometime in mid to late uh, November. Uh, I don't know exactly because it doesn't show up in the records and the, uh, and uh, some of the covers are missing. I only have the letters, uh, but uh, there's a female uh, where I wrote he was in charge of E Company for a few days and it was in early December and it actually, uh, you know, on, on the, the address, uh, there's E Company. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's basically his uh, okay, journey thank you. in the division. So you, you're dying to read us an extract. So let's let's do that now. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I mean, um, as an intro, uh, I, I used one of his uh, letters where he reflects about the war. Uh, it says, "The whole difficulty seems to be that each new generation must find out for itself how dreadful, costly, and futile war is, instead of being able to profit by the knowledge gained." by other generations who have also found out the truth uh, to their great sorrow. This has been the second world war in my lifetime, and I know that those who fought in World War I hope never to see another. I know also that those of, you, those of us who are fighting in this one hope never to see another, but it may be that there are too many people of all nations who do not actually live, fight, and witness actual combat conditions, and for that reason, do not know it in all its horror. Maybe those who are left when this conflict is over will be able to work out a plan to end it for all time. Obviously, wow. it didn't work out, but yeah, uh, it you know uh, it, it it resonates strongly these days. You know, with the uh, Ukraine war and everything, uh, that this is still a thing. And uh, and yeah, I mean that's the whole point of my work. It was the same for the Missing Islander and Till Victory. You know, it's more a book about peace than about war itself um and and it makes you realize you know um what a chance we have to be uh in in peace well that's a very good sentiment and a very good philosophy to hold to but with, this is hurtgen forest week so clearly if you've got a whole box of letters he must refer to the hurtgen forest you've been there filming that's obviously the bit you want to do what what do you want to talk about with regards to that horrendous battle campaign and we'll go through the photos you took with and folks if you've enjoyed edwin shows and ed shows and frank shows then there's some more in fantastic photos to get you a sense of what it's like being in that forest you can see in the way clement took them you can see the kind of the 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 the, the, the fog that hangs in the background and the dampness is in the air and we'll go through them as we we talk so so her uh the hurt gun how does he describe it what was his reaction to being there yeah, um, I was lucky enough to be there um, approximately, approximately about the same time as he, he was. Uh, it was in uh, l late October. He uh, arrived in the Hürtgen uh, on November November six, I think, uh, in Zweifel after a few days uh, the rear, um, and uh, he took part in Operation Queen um, on November November sixteenth, uh, and. Um, yeah, he wrote, uh, he wrote on the 18th, um, I have a slight cold, but nothing to even think about. I guess I caught it in this rainy, damp weather. Uh, we have been right out straight these past few days, carrying the fight to the Germans in deadly seriousness. We'll soon break through and cave them in, and I hope it will be in the very near future. Um, so yeah, it took quite a while. Of course, uh, we, we've covered covered that in the previous episodes, uh, and I, I won't go uh, into the history of the Hurgan battle because uh, it has been done extremely well by um, Edward Miller uh, and Edwin Edwin Popkin uh, too. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I was lucky enough to be uh, with two exceptional guides, uh, Katharina and Tobias uh, Kreutzmann. Uh, Kreutzmann from the uh, Hürgenwald Museum um, that I really, uh, yeah, thank you for, for your great work. They uh, uh, took me on the very um, uh, route that Otis took um, in November 1944. So we went to Zweifel and Schevenhütte and, and oh, near Jay uh, where he ended um, his uh, war. 
uh, and that was incredible to to see all those foxholes everywhere and and um, you know ruins of bunkers like those pictures I took um, they are everywhere and it's uh, I mean it's like um, uh, you know Edwin Popkin said uh, on Sunday you have to walk the ground to understand the battlefield and and it's true uh, I, I I've spent so much time reading his letters and and so many years reading about the Hurgan forest uh, and I wish I went there earlier uh, because uh it's a really dark forest it's a very scary place and i cannot imagine what it must have been like for, for these guys uh uh i was on my own shooting for five days there uh all alone and it was quite an experience um and yeah you can see foxholes everywhere a trench like this is a, a german trench uh uh around a german fox uh german bunker there are hundreds and hundreds of foxholes and i just stopped you know uh photographing them because i thought how many thousands of pictures do i need of foxholes you know but it's 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 impressive that they are still there so many years later um they are so well preserved um so yeah that that was crazy and, I, and as edwin said beyond the coal trail which everybody goes to see there are other parts of the battlefield that are far less frequented by visitors mm -hmm. because i mean not many people go there anyway and those that do go they go to the things that are kind of they're pointed to and that are, are famous and the coal trail is is, is probably the key place there and some and the yeah. cemeteries that the cemeteries that are, that are around the, the locations but I mean, I, I sense that you can be walking through some of these forests and you're almost the first person to have been there for, for 70 plus years down some of those paths. Because it, although it's yeah. not a massive forest, it is very, very dense when you get into the middle of it. Yeah, it, it was the case actually near the end of my trip there. Um, we went to, um, I, I, there, there's not even a name for that place. It's very deep in the forest. Um, and this is where um, his regiment took uh, quite a lot of German prisoners. Um, and it, it seemed like we were the first ones to be there in, in 78 years. Uh, the foxholes were completely untouched. Um, and it's very out of the beaten path. And without, you know, tour guides, I wouldn't never be able to find them, you know. Uh, so uh, I, I really, uh, really appreciate the fact that they were there to help me. Uh, um, it, it's such a big place. Uh, there, there was a bunker uh, that uh, Katharina showed me. Uh, and I wanted to, to go back there to shoot uh, inside the bunker uh, for a sequence. And I, I just uh, completely, I, I, I got lost. I got lost in that forest and I couldn't find the bunker. So I used another one because <laughs> I just couldn't find it. And I have Google Maps. But yeah, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's such a big place. And yeah, it's a real maze. Yeah. And, and obviously, as we said at the beginning, without you walking through it, you wouldn't have possibly been able to put together this book and this, this, this documentary in the same way because... It is a, as I say, it's a very alien environment. It's, it's, you've got to go there. I mean, obviously, folks are watching that all of them can travel to these places, hence why we have movies and books. But it, it's, it's not like staying on Utah Beach or, 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 um, the Arnhem Bridge. It re you really are in the middle of nowhere, as, as we found out ourselves a month yeah. ago. So, Feel free to do what you want now. The show is yours. So read some more letters. Tell us about the experiences. Tell us about what the the, the we will we'll go. We've got a, a group photo from the filming and the process there. And we've got a five minute exclusive clip. We will play you towards the end, folks, as well. But you, make sure you say what you want to say in these next few minutes, Clement, because we're everyone's enjoying it. Just just tell us more about the the whole experience. Yeah. Um, well, it was. I didn't know where I was going with that um, because, you know, that's the, the interesting thing about shooting documentaries is that uh, you have a blank slate and you don't know what you're going to get, like interviewing people. Um, I never went there, so it's very hard to plan in advance what you're going to shoot and what you're going to see because you just don't know what you're going to see. Um, so I just let things uh, come to me. Uh, um and um i was very surprised by 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 stuff that i uh, caught on camera um oh, those are uh, these are um uh katarina and tobias who helped me uh uh 
um, in the forest. Um, but yeah, um, I, I didn't know what I was going to get. Uh, like I interviewed, um, that was back in Normandy because I, 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 I started shooting the documentary in Normandy, obviously, uh, uh, near St. Mary Glees and went through all the places it were in, went to like Carouge, uh, right before I entered Paris. And I was very surprised by the kind of stuff that I got. I interviewed a lady, um, who owned the farm, uh, where, uh, his regiment, uh, stayed at and um i was like oh you must be very happy to uh be liberated and and to have the americans uh, at your place and everything and and she told me no uh quite the contrary actually uh, they behave very badly uh you know and so you know what do you make with that you know you're supposed to honor uh, american soldiers in the documentary and you get uh reactions like this um so yeah I, I really didn't know what i was getting into um so that was very an interesting experience i met so many people um uh, museums and historians and veterans and that was crazy uh, but my favorite part was definitely going to hurtgen um, um and, and being on my own on my own for a while there as well um uh, there's a clip uh, that you, you can show um and i'm not sure that i'm going to keep it in the documentary because uh I, i'm still not sure about that because it was filmed with a different camera uh it was completely improvised um i wanted to visit some of those bunkers but in october they are all closed uh, uh to uh preserve the um, the bats population so uh i couldn't enter uh one of them and the only ones the only one i could get in was uh, a bunker in Berstein. Uh, so i went there with a uh um a different camera that i used for the documentary um which can uh shoot in um a night vision uh mm -hmm. so the quality is not as good as the the cameras that i used for the rest of the documentary and it's really improvised and it's really about you know discovering the place um uh, on my own like that but it's a fun uh it's fun stuff uh so uh i thought that maybe uh, your audience would uh like that um uh so maybe you can show that and and right before it uh, there's another uh scene from the documentary uh with reenactors uh we shot that in um, a bunker in normandy but um uh, obviously we, we we shot those scenes uh in normandy even the the scenes uh that are supposed to be uh in hurtgen we shot them in a one of the rare uh pine uh forests uh in normandy uh it was easier um uh with one of otis letters uh, being read about you know um how the bunkers are constructed and everything so quite interesting stuff if you want to show that well let's, let's do that then so we'll, we'll show this another five minute clip so it means me, me and clem will go have, have a break and uh, drink some water and we'll play this for you then we'll come back and do more footage afterwards so here we go folks ils ont assurément consacré beaucoup de temps d'argent et de main d'œuvre à la construction de ces positions. Ils sont faits d'acier de béton épais et sont recouverts de tonnes de terre. De loin, on dirait une colline ou un monticule naturel sur lequel poussent de l'herbe, des vignes et même des arbres. Ils ont par ailleurs des systèmes de ventilation pour la climatisation et la purification de l'air lors des attaques au gaz. Il y a un sacré raffus dehors, mais ça ne nous dérange pas là où nous sommes tapis au fond de ce bunker en béton et en acier que nous avons pris aux Allemands ce matin. C'est juste un grondement sourd ici, et on ne peut même pas dire si c'est notre artillerie ou celle des Allemands qui fait ce boucan. Si c'est Jerry, nous le trouverons demain matin et nous le ferons taire. Donc là, je me trouve à Bergstein, hein, euh, au sommet de la colline 400. Et là, nous allons visiter un bunker qui est un des rares en fait que j'ai pu trouver ouvert à cette période de l'année, hein, euh, euh, parce qu'il est trop démoli pour pouvoir être fermé complètement. Euh, et c'est un, un bunker de type euh, 31, Regalbao 31, euh, qui servait de poste de commandement et de communication. 
Voilà, c'était un bunker d'à peu près 20 mètres de long pour 7 ou 8 mètres de large et qui pouvait abriter jusqu'à 32 hommes. Donc là, on peut voir derrière, à l'arrière du bunker, pourquoi il ne peut pas être complètement fermé. Ce qui va me permettre de pouvoir l'explorer. Donc je vais faire le tour. Ouf. Voilà. Voilà, on peut voir qu'il est quand même assez massif. Hein. Donc pour pouvoir rentrer à l'intérieur, oui, il fait plutôt sombre là-dedans. Je vais passer en vision de nuit et prendre ma petite lampe torche. Et c'est parti. Donc là, je me trouve dans le couloir principal. Euh, on peut voir qu'il était défendu euh, par deux mitrailleuses. Une qui couvrait ici l'entrée euh, du bunker et euh, une autre mitrailleuse ici hein, qui, euh, qui, elle, servait à couvrir l'intérieur du couloir. Donc voilà à quoi faisaient face les rangers qui tentaient de pénétrer dans le bunker. Ils s'étaient pris entre trois feux en fait. Et là-bas également. Et d'ailleurs, on peut voir euh, dans le couloir euh, des impacts euh, autour de l'une des mitrailleuses. Donc il y a dû y avoir de féroces combats pour pouvoir rentrer à l'intérieur du bunker. Il faut que je fasse très attention à ma tête. Vous pouvez voir que les parties métalliques comme ça, d'où l'intérêt de la lampe de poche et de la vision de nuit. Ok, donc là, je vais prendre mon courage à deux mains. La porte est toujours là. entendre l'église de Bergstein sonner. Là, je suis complètement seul dans ce bunker. Enfin, en tout cas, je l'espère. Le bunker a explosé, donc euh, on voit le jour passer à travers cette, certaines fissures, ce qui n'est pas le cas à l'autre bout du bunker où il fait un noir total. Et ici, on peut voir euh, différents, euh, différentes évacuations pour l'air, une sortie de secours. Donc ici était installé en fait la, le poste radio euh, donc voilà, pour les télécommunications. On peut voir la position de mitrailleuse a complètement explosé et c'est celle qui du coup a vu une vue vers l'intérieur du couloir. Vous voyez le, le bunker est assez profond. Énormément de débris par terre hein, ici. Euh, ici on a une large ouverture qui apporte un petit peu de lumière assez réconfortante. <rire> et je pense qu'ici c'est là que les soldats vivaient. Ce qu'on peut voir sur les murs, des, des barres métalliques qui servaient à, à soutenir des lits euh, qui pouvaient être repliés et accrochés à l'aide de ce système de crochets euh, pendant la journée pour avoir tout simplement plus de place dans le bunker. Ici, il n'y a pas de chauve-souris, mais par contre, il y a de sacrées araignées. Elle est immonde. Juste pour vous montrer à quel point il fait noir ici. Hein. Voilà. Ouais, oh là là là, c'est terrible. Je dois vous dire, je suis arachnophobe. Je passe un très très bon moment. Oh, il y a des araignées partout et des nids d'araignées partout. Je crois que je vais pas faire long feu ici, les amis. Je suis vraiment désolé. On a des bouches d'aération. On peut voir ici euh, ces, ces morceaux de bois encore en place. Euh, qui servait en fait euh, à pouvoir clouer des choses dessus, comme des cartes, ce genre de choses. Euh, donc euh, c'était probablement une salle destinée euh, au commandement. Voilà. On peut très bien voir hein, les crochets dont je vous parlais. Et ici encore hein, la trappe, euh, la trappe euh, pour la mitrailleuse, pour défendre l'intérieur du couloir principal. Donc voilà, j'espère que vous avez apprécié euh, cette visite autant que moi. Il est temps pour moi de retrouver la lumière. Well, that's it. That's documentary making as it should be. Going to the locations, being there, experiencing them, walking the site, going in the forest, breathing it, spending time there on your own. Um, it's only it's a pity that more of the big TV documentaries don't do that kind of work these days. It's so much just talk narrations over over wartime footage. It seems to be the standard way. So um, people are asking and, uh, about how you acquire these particular letters and are you in contact with the family? So shall we address that? 
Yeah. Um, well, I've been collecting World War II letters for uh, almost 20 years now, uh, mostly through eBay and stuff like that. But, um, of course, you cannot use um, uh, letters like that, publish them without uh, the, uh, um, do you say, right owners? Um, permission. Uh, yeah. Permission, yeah. And, and, of course, also, I, I think it's normal to uh, reach out to the families uh, to, to uh, you know, at least tell them that I want to use them in the project and to honor their father or grandfather. So I, I did that for every a single soldier that I honored in one of my projects. Uh, that's more than a hundred now. Um, families all over the world. And, and of course, uh, Otis families, family was contacted and I, I'm very grateful that they trusted me enough um, on that project. Um, and yeah, so they are aware of that. Um, he had a son uh, who was born during the, the battle of uh, Hurtgen, uh, but um he unfortunately, unfortunately passed away. Um, but um, Maurice, uh, Maurice, his uh, brother, um, had a son who is still alive today and who in turn had children. So the, the, those are the ones I'm in touch with um, and they're very happy about the project. Um, so it's great. Everybody's happy. Um, yeah. And I wanted to add something about the bunker, um, not about bats or spiders. I'm still freaked out when I watched the, this clip. Uh, again, I'm not sure I'm going to keep it in documentary because uh, production-wise, it's uh, um, not as good as the rest uh, But um, because it was completely improvised. But um, yeah, Otis used to live in those bunkers during the battle. Um, um, sometimes, like he described, uh, as you saw in the reenactment scene, uh, uh, the, the bunkers, the, the German bunkers they used um, for protection against uh, artillery. But um, he also um, built uh, foxholes, uh, not just simple holes in the ground, but uh, more elaborate uh, foxholes. Um, and he described them uh, in his letters. And, and one of the letters is uh, really interesting because he actually did a drawing of, of uh, the, um, the foxhole uh, he built. Uh, and you, you, can, you can see it here. Um, it's a very, very complex uh, construction um, that he described uh, in the letter that I'm going to read to you. Uh, that, that was written in, uh, on the 10th. Of October, so that was not in the Hurtgen Forest. That was uh, in Belgium, uh, near Bullingen, uh, in a very small village called uh, Hüningen. Um, but he, he built the same kind of foxholes uh, in the Hurtgen Forest. So he wrote: um, First, we dug a hole about three feet deep, seven feet long, and five and one half feet wide. Then we took sandbags and pine logs and built it up about two additional feet in height and covered the top with logs, earth, and waterproof covering. The end through which we enter is almost completely sealed as we left an opening barely large enough to wiggle into. We have found this to be good practice because the larger the size of the opening, the more chance for shell splinters to come flying in, flying in, uh, flying in, sorry. After we completed the dugout, we inserted the homemade stove made out of a large rectangular shaped tin can we procured from the kitchen and equipped it with, equipped it with a stovepipe and spark arrestor at the top. I will attempt to draw a picture of it to give you a better idea of what it's like. So that's the, uh, the picture he drew yeah. there. Darling, after I completed the drawing, I am inclined to think that you will be confused by the illustration instead of getting a clear picture of it. I have never been uh, artistically inclined, so I guess it is a rather poor sketch. We camouflaged the structure after we finished it, so you could never tell it might be anything except a mound of earth with a few yards away, with, uh, from a few yards away few yards away. It is in quite dense woods and it's not at all noticeable until one is nearly on top of it. So it was very close to what uh, the German soldiers uh, built. Uh, they mm -hmm. had the same kind of um, stuff to, to protect themselves from shrapnel and, and uh, shell splinters, like Otis said. And when I was in the Caltrail, uh, 
at the end of the the, the trail, I, I told my guide uh, Tobias, uh, oh, I'm, I mean, I, I'm surprised we haven't found anything like um, a shrapnel or something on the ground. And right after I said that, we found so many stuff in the bush like this, just walking on it. And uh, one of these um, shrapnel, uh, like shell splinters, uh, we found is this one, which is huge. And, you know, it, it really, um, now you understand why they had to dig in, you know, uh, and, and build those uh, um, or take cover in, in, you know, German bunkers, because those were the kind of things. Uh, it's very heavy. Uh, I weighed it. I think it's about two kilos uh, or three. Uh, it was flying through the air. Uh, and I can't imagine what it must do to a human body. Um, so, yeah, it's it's really impressive. And and the effects of them. That That's a piece of um, a canteen or a mess kit that I found right next to the shell splinter it's uh, an american um yeah relic uh used to be a messed in and you can see how messed up it is yeah. uh, it, it was um along the, the path the uh, 28th division took uh when they retreated so yeah I, I don't know what happened to uh there's no name on it there's nothing but uh i mean um uh, it, it was a huge threat, uh, those uh, uh, shell splinters or uh, shrapnel. Um, it does a lot of damage. Um, so, yeah, um, building a, a nice uh, and cozy because it, it looked pretty cozy. He had a stovepipe and everything, um, especially during the winter conditions that, uh, you know, uh, the other guests have talk about, talked about. Um, it, it was extremely important. Uh, they, they were not... I mean, he was an officer, so uh, he was a little bit in the rear. Um, as a legion officer, he was going to the, you know, um, to the front line very, very regularly. But uh, uh, he had the chance of, you know, having um, quite a nice uh, place to 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 spend his his night in nights in. But uh, yeah, most of the soldiers were just um, spending uh, their time in a very small hole in the ground. So. Yeah, that's one of the advantages of being an officer, I guess. Yeah, and we we talked with Ed with Ed Miller on the first day about and with Edward as well about the 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 compassion that was shown from one side to other because everybody in that battle was going through the same experience. The weather affected both friend and enemy. The 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 shelling affected both friend and enemy. And and you know you're battling uh, nature and cold and 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 hypothermia as well as you're battling the enemy. Did, did Otis convey any of that in his letters? Did, did he describe the, the battle in that sense at all? Yeah, he wrote about uh, about being very cold, uh, uh, very wet, um, about the fact that um, he was traveling. Um, he was going uh, back and forth from the HQ, like Division HQ or, or Regimental HQ to the front line all the time uh, before he was put in charge of E, e Company. Uh, and he, he really had a lot of pity for um, the frontline soldiers, uh, the rifle companies, uh, mm. as he called them, uh, because they were, um, you know, uh, exposed to the weather all the time. And he didn't envy them at all, but uh, he didn't know at the time that it would be one of them um, after a while. But uh, um, yeah, he, he used to travel uh, a lot um, with the Jeep and a few um, uh, soldiers for his protection. Um, and it was... It, told about how hard it was to um, navigate the forest in the, in the Jeep. Uh, they had to build um, corduroy roads. Yep. Is, yep. is that the right yep. word? Yeah. That's right. um, because, uh, because of all the mud and everything. Um, and he couldn't be protected from the elements because uh, he explained how, um, in one of his letters, how he had to um, uh, put the windshield down um, just in case they fell into an ambush or something to have their rifles uh, at ready. Um, so he, he was completely covered in mud and, and, and rain and, and, and snow. And uh, so that was quite a tough trip uh, every time. 
So yeah, he, he talked about that, about being cold, about how dark it was, um, you know, without flashlight that he couldn't light fires and, you know, it was a um, very, very tough time. Uh, but uh, the most impressing, impressive, sorry, um, um, testimony I had was um, my, my good friend, uh, Florent Plana uh, from World War II Veterans Memories. Uh, uh, another French guy uh, about my age. Yeah, uh, we know Flo. Yeah, Flo's yeah. a great guy. Flo and Jenny. Yeah, he, he was kind enough to um, uh, give me one of his interviews with a veteran uh, from the 28th Division um, uh, for the documentary um, because I couldn't interview him myself. But uh, he, he passed away two years ago, I think. Um, and it's such an incredible interview, one of the best ones I ever saw. Um, and he allowed me to put it in the documentary. Um, and he, he he suffered from frostbite. He was evacuated because of that. Um, uh, so, but it was covered already in the other episodes. Uh, but um, yeah, it, the, there were a lot of threats like this: the the cold, the the the, the shrapnel, the. Uh, Death was everywhere. The mines. Uh, Otis told about uh, some of the officers in his uh, battalion that was, were killed by mines. Uh, they were uh, um, checking out some some new kind of mine, um, and they uh, were killed while doing so. Um, tells everything in his letters. And that that's um, yeah, that's the kind of stuff he was talking about. It's really a rare thing. Um, yeah. because so obviously you, so he covers the weather, he covers the cold, he covers the dangers. What about as an officer, any sense of the, why are we here? Because, you know, as we've talked about this week, there's whole questions can be asked about why on earth the first army fought through that area at all. As someone who is at regimental HQ, he must have some idea of what the, the objectives are. Does he hint in his letters about you know, basically, why the fuck are we here? This is stupid, or is he? Does he keep diplomatic uh, about the Hurgen Forest, or yeah, in general, Hurgen well, Forest particularly, but in general, um, the Hurgen Forest not so much. Um, but um, in general, he has very strong opinions uh, about the Germans, and that was a very interesting thing to discuss with Tobias and Katarina because they are my guys were German. Um, mm. And and th that's one of the question I, I questions I asked them in the documentary is um, what did it feel like you know reading uh, Otis words uh, because they are very harsh sometimes. Um, I, I told you about that um, old lady in Carouge, uh, which were, was complaining about how the soldiers were um, behaving in her farm. But you can, I mean, it's not that simple you know it's never all black or white you know uh, those were young guys who went through a lot of uh, horrors and and otis did too he, he talks about um in, in belgium he was uh, on the secret line he was facing ss troops um and he talks in his letters about uh, some of the wounded being uh, american wounded being executed by the ss and stuff like that and the fact that it you know his unit doesn't want to uh, make prisoners anymore um and he really has harsh words about the germans but of course i had to put it all in context because a lot of things have changed since then but uh uh yeah it's it's really uh interesting to see how the american soldiers were talking about the germans at the time and um i have uh, i have uh, something that i can read to you uh somewhere yeah that's something he wrote in carouge um that was a uh, few days Five days before he entered Paris, um, he um, he found out about the mayor of the town being killed by um, an improvised explosive device, a booby trap that was mm -hmm. uh, left by some SS soldiers on German corpses. Um, they are on men. And um, he was completely disgusted by that. And, um, and he wrote... They say the only good German is a dead one, and I really believe it. Uh, this outfit didn't take any German prisoners at, at first. We're talking about the 4th Infantry Division. Yep. They found five of our, of our paratroopers hanged in a barn on D-Day and pierced with bayonets, so they just killed every one of the German bastards they found. He used the words German bastards a lot. 
There are still many prisoners who start for the rear under guard and who never get there. Just try to imagine, if you can, how our boys feel when a damn German sniper hides in, in a hedgerow or other place of concealment and picks off eight or ten of their buddies. Then after he's surrounded, cut off, and then uh, and they get a couple of close hits with bazookas. Down he comes with hands in the air, yelling, Camerad, Camerad, believe me, they don't show him much mercy. They hate snipers worse than poison, and I don't blame them a bit. So yeah, and he um, he had a lot of um, he saw it with his own eyes later on um, in in Belgium and and Germany, um, and well he 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 knew that something was, had to be done, and he talked a lot with the civilians in France, um, how they suffered for four years. So uh, he he knew that uh, there was a job to be done, and that's why the the book is called uh, until the job is done it's mm. uh, um so yeah he knew why he was there um and yet uh it didn't make much sense in the end because he had lost so many men um uh, i think the, the fourth infantry division was the second worst hit uh division um american division in world war ii and uh um he when when um, when v, uh, VE Day um, arrived, he didn't actually uh, celebrate at all. Uh, that was the whole point of the whole thing, you know. Like you you expect that uh, you expect him to be very happy, and but um, he wrote. Uh, I took that except uh, except out. Um, it's uh, <clears throat> yeah. There uh, he wrote that on on May eight, I think. Uh, in Paris, uh, right after he got out of the hospital. There are crowds of thousands of people in the street marching, singing, and bands playing, and all that sort of merrymaking, but somehow I am not in the mood to join in on the fun. I just don't seem to get any kick out of it. I guess I remember too vividly the men in my company, and also my brother, who are not able to celebrate now that victory has come at last. So yeah, he... Um, He's lost so much. He went through so much. Uh, he missed his uh, son being born, and and yeah, there was a job to be done. But um, yeah, did the job like all the. It, it is fascinating that he's he's unable to enjoy VE Day because thousands and thousands of soldiers, British, American, and others, had been through terrible times, but were able to celebrate VE Day. So it, it's obviously something to do with his reflective nature. There's something, I mean, I yeah. don't know him as well as you know him. You must feel like you know him or knew yeah. him. And and yet he's he's unable to see that because of the losses he experienced. And and, and that, that, that makes him a very interesting eyewitness because reflection often came much later. I'm thinking of some of the people I knew that everyone, you know, heard of Shifty Power. Shifty Power didn't really give any thought to World War II till he was in his 70s or 80s. It was just gone on mm -hmm. with life. And the reflection came much, much later. And that's something I'm sure people who are watching whose fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers were involved, they didn't start getting reflective till they get old themselves. But to be, be, to be thinking about it in your 30s, was really really unusual. And do you think you know? As if this is Herc and Forest Week, it, it was the Herc and Forest was was the turning point for him. Was that was that where it was? He experienced his worst. Obviously, that's where he was wounded. For 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 him and for most of the guys in, in his unit, uh, and he writes about it. Uh, he, he actually wrote everyone who went through the whole thing from D Day, June sixth, nineteen forty four, to Hürgen Forest, where I was injured. Said the Hürgen Forest was the toughest fighting of all. Wow. Um, and also, um, I mean, uh, it actually shows in the letters, not because he, he wrote about it. He wrote about it, but he didn't write much during the Hürgen Forest battles because he was so busy. Mm. Uh, but uh, he, he got so reflective because uh, he spent months in the hospital after he was wounded and, and only had time, you know. Uh, he had time to reflect on all this. And while he was waiting um hoping to get back to his unit he was getting all these letters from the family and friends telling about oh your friend from home he got killed in action in europe and your brother got killed in action in the pacific 
and this guy from your hometown was killed as well and and every almost every day I, there, there are at least a dozen of, of guys he knew uh, he writes about who got killed in action so he understands you know the price of of the freedom he brought to uh the mm -hmm. people of europe and and this is really the important thing about it all it's not about uh you know the battles the strategy i mean it's it's important but the most important thing is the sacrifice you know it's it's all these young guys um otis was, was an old guy you know for his unit mm -hmm. but he lost so many 19 year olds and 18 year olds um for for nothing in in, in, <clears throat> in till victory there's a soldier from the same regiment who uh celebrated his birthday in here in her gun and forgot about his birthday and he got killed a few months later and he was only 20. uh and i'm in touch with his family and his um, sister is still alive today and still grieving him mm -hmm. so that's that's a lot of that's a huge price to pay uh for freedom and we must be especially us french people uh very appreciative about about it all and that's the whole point of my my work you know my, my mission is to uh to um make them immortal in some some way you know uh by telling their stories and um i don't consider myself an historian i already told that uh, in uh, the previous episode we did together uh, because i didn't study history and i'm you know i don't have that title uh but um i'm really interested in you've got a few story. film awards though now that's that's quite good that's more than i've got so you're, you're doing all right you've got book <laughs> awards and film awards so uh someone's noticing you and and you know that's... you're being very humble there but the, what what i see your process is is it, it's it's twofold that uh, if if, for example, Otis's letters had just been released to the public as a sequence of, of, of correspondence, that would provide the reader some information. But what you have done is the, the layered it up with your own experiences of following his, his footsteps, going to the same places, being of the same age, with the benefit to look back at the events and look at after action reports, and understand the history from elsewhere. So you've 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 added to what the original source material is and and and, and created your own message. So while we've got the, the graphic on screen there, you know, your your message is you don't want to tell people you're not trying to convey people that the historical record of the fourth infantry division in World War II. You're trying to uh, convey what it meant for one person who was in it and how he, yeah. he shared that with his family and then how you are sharing that with with a word an audience in it. it'll be 2023 is is that about what you're you're aiming for yeah yeah, yeah of course it's uh i mean it could have been in any division uh, i don't care about what division it was in you know uh i have to provide the context but it's yeah. not the most important thing and and you know until victory there are soldiers from all na uh, allied nations there are british uh, canadian french soldiers as well as americans uh even the polish soldier and yeah etc but uh it, it doesn't it doesn't matter um they all say the same thing you know they all want to be home they all want to be with their loved ones but there's a job to be done and uh and they have to do it and they go through a horrible time um mm -hmm. and and we must never forget what they went through so that you know because it's thanks to them that we're free today and yeah. and we must preserve that for um as long as possible otherwise it would have been all in vain you know which, so, which brings us back to what we said at the beginning about the fact that you're, you you see this as a multimedia approach. There will be a book for those who want books. There'll be a film for those who want to watch films. And there's people who want to watch me can watch you talking about it via this medium. And and then, you know, you there'll be websites as well. And that, that's the way of conveying history these days. We had a question earlier about how long the documentary film is likely to be. I mean, you're obviously in the editing process right now. So what kind of length are we looking at, do you think? Like I said, I I, I, I I didn't go in there with a plan, you know. It, it was just uh, let's take a couple of cameras and 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 go on this trip. And uh, it was all made thanks to uh, a lot of people who helped me on the crowdfunding campaign that I really want to thank because uh, they helped it. Uh, they helped it uh, become a real thing. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I I think it's gonna be about an hour and a half long. 
um if i don't stop myself it's gonna be four hours long and i think it's well, you can you can hide the rest of it in the extras put it put it <laughs> online have links to it put it in the in the in the in the secret bits but yeah it, it, it i know what you go because it's the same thing i have with the how long should a show be because yeah. sometimes people have got enough detail to fill three hours but how many people will watch a three-hour show how many people watch a one-hour show so it's always that that difficulty of banting up we've just i'm putting it up on screen now uh, Real History, that's Jared Frederick, who's written books about uh, Dick Winters and Ron Spear. He's a friend of mine. He's saying that his furious, furious Fourth World War II Living History Association would be happy to get the, help get the word about this book. So if you don't know Jared, I will put you in touch with Jared. His of course. grandfather was in the Fourth Division, um, so they've been doing some filmmaking stuff. So I'll put you to it, unless you happen to, you, do you know Jared already? No, no. I well, don't. there we are. There's a connection made, folks. So Jared and okay. Clement, we can put you in touch and you can work together because Jared has a film channel on YouTube as well. So the two of you can do some good together. So awesome. um, we've, we've talked about when it's going to be available next June, the book and the film. We've talked about the length of it. We've talked about the, 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 um, the protagonist. People are asking what happened to him after the war. Um, and it's up to you whether you want to say that or not. Yeah. Um, sure. He um he was a, a watchmaker uh, from a, a very small town in Vermont called Rutland. Um, there's about uh, seventeen thousand people there, um, and it was uh, mostly known for uh, very harsh winters. Um, so after the war, he uh, spent a little bit of time in the National Guard again, and um, and opened uh, his own um, watchmaking shop. Um, with his son, uh, Robert, who uh, was born during the Hurricane Frost mm -hmm. battle. Um, and he died uh, in 1981. Um, so, yeah, he apparently had a nice life afterwards. Uh, all he wanted to was to live in peace uh, with his wife and his son uh, and, and forget about the war, like all the veterans, uh, you yeah. know. Uh, yeah. Uh, in his letters, he wrote about um, the home they would uh, build for themselves, a small house with green uh, shades or something like that, uh, uh, green windows, or I don't remember. Um, and I, I think he got it, uh, so he clearly deserved it. Um, so yeah, uh, he um, uh, he joined his unit uh, for a short short time um, after uh, VE Day uh, in June 1945. He went to Bamberg, where the uh, uh, his regiment was, uh, and stayed there for a while until he was sh shipped back to the U.S. in July 1945. But the interesting thing is that um, in his letters he wrote about uh, not knowing anybody in his unit anymore. Uh, he wow, was asking yeah. about so and so, and they were all killed or wounded, and and he wrote his wife uh, that th there's no one I know uh, in my unit, and I only left it a few few months ago, because of course um, uh, the Hurgen Forest was a terrible battle for the Fourth Infantry Division, um, but um, but the uh, I think they had something like five thousand casualties uh uh four thousand casualties um in in the hurrigan forest alone um but um yeah after that there was the battle of the bulge and the uh, fourth infantry division was hit uh, quite hard again so of course all all the guys that he knew were uh, either dead or uh in the hospital so when he joined his unit he was uh, his company was very happy to see you know to to finally reach them uh again but uh it was just a completely different unit made uh, um of replacements like he was uh only a year earlier you know yeah so well i mean all we can say now is that we wish you every success with it uh the editing process is 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 in some ways the worst bit, isn't it? The going out there, being on location is kind of neat, even though it's a bit scary there, the putting it together, but the editing is it gets stuck in editing hell. Uh, what to leave yeah. in, what to keep out. It's, yeah. I like it. I, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm starting to uh, get into the fun part, you know, because uh, like all the sequences are uh, edited now. Um, I just have to put it all together and, and, and I have to write the voiceover and record it. Um, I'll do it with this mic there. Yeah. Uh, same, and uh, same as mine. Yeah. A good blue <laughs> yeti. Yeah. Well, 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 
we'll try and get some commission from the company because that's what I use. Like I'll pull mine down, but if I pull mine down, my ceiling will come down with it. But mine is above oh. my head in the same place. So yeah, good. Um, yeah, so but this, more... this, this, this is the fun part to actually put everything together. Uh, you know, with the the voiceover that uh, yeah. uh, acts as a you know main thread throughout the film and and see the film become a film for the first time. Yeah. That that's uh, I'm really looking forward to it and. Yeah, it must be finished in April, and um, and it will be released uh, in June. So there are two premieres um, uh, scheduled. Uh, uh, it will be in Normandy uh, for those of you who uh, can make it to Normandy for the D-Day celebrations, because uh, one of them will be on June the third in the uh, at the Normandy Victory Museum. Uh, and the second one will be at the Airborne Museum in Saint Mary Glise on the fifth of June, so the day before uh, the um, the D-Day uh, anniversary. So I'm really looking forward to it. And then the movie will be online uh, for free uh, a few days later. Uh, um, I don't know when exactly yet, but uh, around the same time as the book is released. So. Well, you can come back next June and do a quick update on the premieres and, and how it's going. And there may be some other news you have by then because it's that's still six months away. We've got uh, uh, other twists and turns before then. But Clément, it's been absolutely amazing talking to you. People are, are complimentary about your style, your passion, your dedication. There, there's you. comments about the authenticity of the reenactor footage, the the staging of it, the fact you're on, on location there, in getting that that B-roll of the, of the actual forest is all amazing stuff. So... Yeah, it's a, it just we we'll wish we wish you well, and we can't wait to have you back again and talk about your next project. But I'm going to take you off screen for a second while I tell people about I, tomorrow, and I'll bring you back in a second. So just, yes. just okay. give me a minute, and I'll come back to you. So, folks, tomorrow Chris Hartley is coming on to talk about his book, The Lost Soldier. So another similar um, uh, situation. It's a soldier of the 28th Division who he has put together his story by the letters he wrote home to his wife. So that's a fantastic show. Similar to today's, but different division, same experience. Uh, so same time tomorrow. Then on Thursday, uh, Yuri Beckers is joining us for a deep look at the ninth division's role in the Hurricane Forest. I've known Yuri for an incredibly long time, been inviting him to World War II DV since I first started two and a half years ago. And I don't know quite what has taken two and a half years to get him on the show, but you'll be, if you have never heard of Yuri Beckers, you will know who he is after Thursday. His ninth division website is insanely good. The dedication he has spent over the last years interviewing veterans and collating information, it's insane. So we'll do that on Thursday. And then Friday, we're harking back to finishing off the Sino-Japanese walk. Toby Lincoln is joining me to talk about the Nanjing massacre. And then Saturday, lots more stuff. We've got a show from Boona with the incredible Philip Bradley. We've got more stuff coming up that I can't remember right now. But I'm going to bring Clement back in to say goodbye. And if you have anything else you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, do a quick shout out to Yuri. Uh, he's a friend of mine. Uh, and yeah, I agree. He's doing a fantastic work. Uh, I got in touch with him uh, through Teal Victory and uh, yeah. looking forward to his episode. And also the SAS episode you're going to do with Chris uh, Ryan. Yeah, yeah that'll be good. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah, that sounds Saturday, isn't it? That's Chris Ryan. And uh, I yeah. can't wait to, to talk to them about that because SAS is everybody's uh, favorite unit in the UK because of the, the BBC show. So that'll be fantastic no rest for the wicked i've got so much work coming up but it's been i enjoy every minute of it and folks people who send me emails saying you must be tired yes i'm a bit tired but i love doing this i've got christmas coming up but anyway thank you everybody for your attention don't forget to to like what we're doing share what we're doing consider becoming a patron or a youtube channel member and don't forget to check out Clemon's website and if you haven't ordered the previous book get that ordered and make a a, a, a space on your shelf for the next one that's coming out in june so thank you very much Clemon. it's been great talking to you this is thank you for having me. TV. I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Bye.